welcome to this afternoon session on um, solving homelessness. Um, I think solving is quite a challenging word and I think we as the panel would probably prefer to talk about preventing and tackling homelessness and you'll probably hear some terms around designing out homelessness as well as, as we go on this afternoon. So firstly, I'm Neelam Sunder and I am the lead homelessness officer at the Combined Authority um, and I joined last year and have been involved in a programme of work around homelessness and working with the Homelessness Task Force um, to look at how we seek to design out homelessness across the region and embed homelessness prevention within the mainstream strategies of the West Midlands Combined Authority. And joining me this afternoon on this panel is Jean Templeton, who is the Chief Exec at St Basil's and also the Independent Chair of our Homelessness Task Force. Next to Jean is Jim Crawshaw, who is the Head of Housing and Homelessness at Coventry City Council. And also we've got Lorna Gavin, who is the Head of Diversity, Inclusion and Corporate Responsibility um, Officer, would you say? Head, head, head of? Head. Sorry. At uh, Gowling, um, WLG. <laughs> And then we've got, at the end, is um, Cal Coley, who is the Head of Service Commissioning at Birmingham um, City Council. So, I think we're going to start with um, a short video from the World Economic Forum on Housing First and what Finland have done around that. So, if we could play the video, please. <laughs> So just a short video and it gives us some food for thought um, and as some of you may know we also have our own housing first pilot here in the region which our panel will, will come on to discuss. So I'm going to start by asking our panel some questions and then hopefully later I will invite you to ask us some questions as well. So starting off then Cal, um, can you give us an insight into the scale of the problem of homelessness in Birmingham? a video which is focusing on uh, rough sleeping mainly but I think it's fair to say that that is the visible tip of what we consider to be a homelessness iceberg so we'll start with rough sleeping so in Birmingham for example since 2012 we have seen a 588 percent increase in rough sleeping in our city um, but if we put that in context in terms of wider homelessness numbers um, we have circa 20,000 um, people that are at risk of either at risk of homelessness, are homeless, or going through the homelessness system. Within that, um, we've got circa 4,000 um, young people that go through the homelessness <coughs> system, and also in circa 3,000 uh, families in temporary accommodation. So that just kind of gives you uh, the scale of the problem. Mm -hmm. I think it's also fair to say that it's widely recognised that our housing system is broken. So if we look at how that manifests itself in terms of the housing supply market uh, in Birmingham, what we've essentially got is a, a lack of affordable housing options, particularly for uh, larger households um, and families. Um, but we've got limited supply in terms of four bed houses plus. Birmingham's a young city. Mm -hmm. uh, we know 
that young people find it difficult to access secure and independent accommodation for reasons around low income, lack of experience, unemployment. We've got the supply there, but it's not accessible um, in, in terms of being able to respond to that. So the knock-on effect of that is young people uh, stay in um, wider family environments for longer, and then that has a knock-on effect in terms of uh, demand for larger housing. Um, we've got a growing population, and at the moment, homelessness seems to be the only clear route in terms of solving people's housing uh, problems. Issues in terms of areas of priority, domestic abuse, as you would expect, uh, ending of short hold assured tenancies, and exclusion by uh, family uh, members. There's also a link between deprivation um, and uh, homelessness as well. So if you look at low income, if you look at employment rates, these act as barriers in terms of access to um, housing. So that's a key issue for us in the city. Um, and the other area is um, health and wellbeing, which is a growing area of concern. So our responses to homelessness for some time have been overly housing focused with uh, a little focus in terms of recovery, um, in terms of well-being. So if you look at the numbers of children in our temporary accommodation, so the impact in terms of moving from schools, um, impacts on mental health and impact on family uh, cohesion as well. So, so as you can see, it's, it's very, very complex mm. and it's very, very entwined, which means that no one single agency can resolve this issue alone. And I think I'll stop there because I could talk for an hour <laughs> on this. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Cal. And so, Jim, you know, you're in Coventry now. So can you give us an insight of, of you know, similarly like Cal, what, what's, what's going on in Coventry and what's the scale of the challenge? So our issues are very similar to Birmingham, but on a smaller scale, as you'd expect. Um, significant issue for us is the numbers of families and single people in temporary accommodation. We've got 600. And with that, not only comes with us having to uproot families from where they live in the city and placing them you know, wherever we have viable temporary accommodation, but there's a real financial impact on us as a council. Um, last year, we overspent our budget of around about five and a half million pounds, specifically on temporary accommodation. So with that comes obviously that financial pressure at a time where our finances are decreasing. So um, there's an awful lot of emphasis from the local authority in terms of trying to deal with the issue, trying to get people into permanent homes. But we're finding it difficult securing accommodation. Um, Coventry, we don't own our own housing stock now, so we're reliant on working with our housing association partners. And we've got some really good links, and they play a real key role in assisting us um, in trying to deal with the issue, but there just isn't enough accommodation there. We've got 14,000 households on our housing waiting list, and we let 1,400 social housing properties a year. So you've got a one in 10 chance, if you're on the list, of getting housed in a year. And of course, that list is always churning and staying at around the, the 14,000. Um, Coventry's the, I've only worked there for five months, but one of the first things I was told, um, we're the fastest growing city outside of London and the South East. Um, and with that obviously comes a pressure on housing, not just in terms of social housing, but housing for everybody who's, who's moving into the city. Um, so private rents have gone up, the local housing allowance, so for those people on benefits, has been frozen um, as part of the welfare reform. So it's really difficult for households to access private rented accommodation, and therefore many of them turn to us um, to secure accommodation through social housing. And just like the vast majority of local authorities in the country, the main reason for homelessness is the ending of a short, short hold tenancy in the private rented sector for families who approach us. Um, so we see families approaching us, having lost their tenancy for a variety of reasons, and obviously we're looking to, to accommodate them either into private rented sector or social housing. Um, rough sleeping, again, not quite on the scale of Birmingham, but our increases have been. Um, we do an official count every year for government, and two years ago we counted six on any one given night, bearing in mind that that, was, that night is in November, and last November we counted 25. We did a street count a couple, a couple of months ago. It was the warmest night of the year, um, and we found close to 60 people living on the streets of Coventry, which was 10 times what we had a number of years ago. Now, you know, there's some great opportunities that we'll go on to in terms of what we're doing to try and resolve that issue, but the issue is beginning to escalate and increase. 
And yeah, so temporary accommodation, the rough sleeping numbers and the visibility of that, um, and obviously the fact that we have so many people sleeping rough on our streets, and that securing accommodation are the three main challenges. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. So, Cal, Jim, I think you've done a good picture in kind of building and telling us about what is happening in Birmingham and Coventry. So, coming on to now, what, what kind of work is going on in the two cities around tackling, whether it's rough sleeping, whether it's homelessness amongst children and families, for young people. Can you give us a bit of a view on the sort of work that the City Council and its partners are doing? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so, we ha now have our fourth homeless prevention strategy in the city, and all of the work that we do essentially hangs off that. And contained within uh, the homeless prevention strategy is a pathway. It's a pathway approach which sits very uh, similarly with the work of the West Midlands Combined Authority. And essentially, um, what we've got there is um, a series of interventions across the pathway, which includes, you know, what can partners do in the universal space? So, you know, if we give examples there, what's the role of GPs in that space in terms of tackling homelessness, for example? What is the role of schools in tackling homelessness? Um, through to targeted and crisis interventions that are uh, commissioned by the local authority or delivered by uh, partner agencies, through to recovery and resilience um, to uh, sustainable housing. So, um, under the prevention strategy, um, this agenda remains a key priority uh, for the city. And what we want through the strategy is a very different approach to everything that we've we've done before, our, our approaches have to be more upstream. So, you know, what do we do in terms of preventing homelessness from happening in the first place? How do we respond quickly uh, to people when they do become homeless? How do we support recovery and resilience so that people do not come back around? And how do we ensure that there is a good supply of sustainable housing? So that's our ambition. That's also our delivery plan, if you like. And what we've been doing over the last year or so is, is putting some meat to those delivery plans. So we've got Homeless Partnership Board, uh, which is uh, 30 agencies strong. It, it consists of uh, strategy agencies all the way from um, probation to public health to social care um, to uh, the police, all the way through to housing providers and the community and, and the faith sector as well. So uh, just to kind of give you some examples of the type of work that's happening so far, um, we've had uh, one of our agency, Birmingham Voluntary Agents, uh, BBSC, um, who are developing excellent standards. So any agency uh, working in the sector around homelessness will voluntarily sign up to these standards in terms of an excellence mark so that we can ensure that when uh, people interact with a range of agencies in the city, they can expect a consistent standard in terms of the support that they receive. The other growing area is, is homelessness and health. And this is a, an agenda which has been very, very difficult to push, but nevertheless, we, we, you know, we're moving into a good space with this now. So this is our work with our CCG colleagues, it's with our adult social care colleagues, and it's with our providers and the GPs. So what is their role in terms of preventing homelessness and supporting individuals that go through the health system so that they can better aid their recovery um, and support? We've got pieces of work around uh, less regulated sectors, the exempt sector, for example. And similarly, uh, we're creating a checklist for referral agencies. We're developing a, a charter of care for people accessing that provision. And we're creating a premises of concern protocol, which is around safeguarding. So when things do go wrong, uh, we can address that. Um, we're still also very fortunate to be able to carry out commissioning around uh, housing, well-being and support services, but we've changed that now. We've got a really good, clear focus on health and well-being, upstream information, advice and guidance. Um, so we've got a series of interventions from health and well-being hubs to uh, supported accommodation around crisis and longer-term provision, all the way through to uh, recovery and support. Um, 
There's also um, quite a bit of work um, taking place around key partners as well. So we're focusing on the key cohorts. So who's likely to become homeless? And can we have a specific pathway for those cohorts of individuals? So the, the, the people that are bubbling to the surface, as you would expect, are uh, people with experience of uh, institutional settings, mm -hmm. such as young people leaving care, people coming out of institutions, such as prisons, um, as well as people coming out of health services. Um, so there's a specific plan uh, around that as well. Um, we're having a, some extensive dialogue with uh, our partners in criminal justice as well because we know that that's a, a, a growing area of concern for us as well. Um, and I guess um, the, the other area is very much around strategic leadership as well. So what we've got for the first time, and I haven't shared this with colleagues, and um, what we've got for the first time is the different directorates within the local authority from economy to HR to the obvious ones of housing and adult social care, providing their own delivery plans in terms of their service areas as to how they will um, take leadership in addressing homelessness. So um, I think it's fair to say that there's quite a fair bit going on. Mm -hmm. um, but what we've also got under that are a Pacific government funded initiatives. So mm -hmm. I won't talk about housing first, but um, you know, Birmingham is the accountable body uh, supporting that initiative. We receive funding around rough sleeper initiatives, which means that we can maximise our accommodation, um, particularly for couples and peoples with pets, because that's always been a barrier mm -hmm. in the past. Uh, we've been able to put more health resources on the front line as well in terms of, of rough sleeper initiatives. And we've recently been awarded um, some funding around uh, rough sleepers and mental health. Mm -hmm. So we've got a CCG uh, lead around that. Um, we're doing some work around cultural change as well with the community and the faith sector because there's a real ro uh, role there for that sector. And how do we encourage them to do more upstream uh, interventions? And lastly, mm -hmm. um, we've also joined the Health Now Alliance. So we're um, doing some work there around peer support and just making sure that in terms of people accessing health interventions, be that going into GP surgeries or attending other health appointments, there is peer support around them so that they can maximise their health and well-being. Um, I, I could go on, um, but, but I will stop there. Thank you, Cal. And Jim, similarly? Yes. <coughs> so in terms of Coventry, we've got a housing and homelessness strategy that um, went live in March. We're going out for consultation this week on a strategy specifically regarding rough sleeping. So all of the work that we do hangs off those strategies. I think there are a couple of real opportunities for us, and I guess positives, in, in a time when we're seeing our numbers coming up. Um, in Coventry, we have, if you've been to the city centre recently, there is significant numbers of new purpose-built student flats being built in the city. You look around, you see the cranes, um, lots are open and lots aren't. With that comes an opportunity for us because we're beginning to have discussions with landlords who were previously in the market of housing large numbers of students who are now really struggling. Um, not good for them, but an opportunity for us in terms of looking to try and bring some of that accommodation back in for family use with the students. And of course, not all the students want to go into purpose-built um, accommodation, but a large number do, and they're being built at really good standards. Most now have got gyms, lots of other facilities within those. So there's a real opportunity, and we met with the University of Coventry last week, and we'll be going out and, and meeting a large number of their landlords to try and, and get more properties in. Um, Cal talked about there's lots of funding at the moment around rough sleeping coming out of central government. They've set a target to half rough sleeping by 2022 and to eliminate it by 2027. And with that has come some cash. So in terms of rough sleeping in Coventry, we've got more resources than we have um, probably ever. We've got somebody who coordinates all of our rough sleeping services. We've got people out there doing outreach work, engaging with rough sleepers all the time. In Coventry, we didn't have that because a few years ago, it wasn't an issue. When there was only half a dozen people on the streets, it wasn't really a significant issue. There should, of course, be no one sleeping rough. But now that we see it and it is so visible and there's that money there in order for us to, to look to try and reduce and eliminate rough sleeping ourselves, and we're setting ourselves a target, a nice and easy target of eliminating rough sleeping in Coventry by 2022. 
So you know that that will be what we're consulting on in terms of our rough sleeping strategy. So there is, I think, some real opportunities there um, for us to try and get into that market and try and solve some of those issues. But of course, they're they're not easy to do. Thank you, Jim. Okay, Jean. So St. Basil's very well known. I'm sure most of you will have already heard of them. Um, so you work with young people who are either have experienced homelessness or are at risk of being homeless. So ha what, what is going on for young, young people yeah. right now? Yeah, good question really. And, and really interesting in terms of both, you know, Cal and Jim's description, you'll see all the work that's going on around tapping it and yet the numbers are going in the wrong direction. And people think, what on earth? Mm -hmm. Why is it when so much effort's going in? I, I, think, I think young people, it's really interesting. So, so we work with 16 to 25 year olds. So the least experienced citizens, okay? Um, and if you think about what, what is the offer for young people in this country? What, what do we have? If you are successful in the education system, and you, ha you are able to live in a family home, and you go on into higher education. There's all sorts of efforts to ensure that your next part of the journey, you know, sort of preparing for ultimate employment, getting your degree and all the rest of it, you will have a housing offer which underpins that. You'll have an awful lot of support as well to ensure that you have a good time, that you learn lots of life skills, that you make new friends, you know, and then you sort of probably trade off from really nice new although student, uh, students have very different aspirations now about the kind of accommodation. It used to be, you know, you start off in really nice hall of residence, you know, a bit like leaving home, you know, and you still get looked after and get all your meals. Then you go into sort of like a bit more independence and, you know, trade off into mm. flat, and then you go into grotty house, because grotty <laughs> house is the third, and you know then you can afford to live, and you're, you know, you don't, you won't have your heating on, but you can go out and have a few drinks. So, so there is that whole rite of passage if you are successful in the education system. Mm. If you're not successful in the education system for all sorts of reasons in, in this country, and it's the same all over the place, there is no housing offer. So what you do is you stay at home if you can. Now, in the last decade, the number of 20 to 34-year-olds who remain in the parental home has gone up by 28%. So something like 700,000 young people will stay at home. So the average, I'm sorry those of you who've got young families, but the average, <laughs> age, the average age of leaving home now is about 32, okay? I've got a 29-year-old who I'm like, get out there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that also, bank of mum and dad, bank mm. of mum and dad is now, depending who, which paper you read, is either the ninth or the tenth largest mortgage lender, mm. okay? It also pays 2.3 billion billion into rent payments for our youth. So if we've got those resources, then actually our kids are probably going to be okay. But for the young people, and that's about one in 20, and that's been a fairly consistent figure throughout. So St. Basil's had research back in you know, the 90s all the way through. It was always about one in 20. Now, sadly, as a percentage of those that are actually homeless, the 16 to 24-year-old percentage is going up and up. And, and there is a chicken and egg element here, because if you don't have a housing offer for youth, if you don't build affordable housing, then actually, what is the route? If things break down, and as Cal and Jim have said, you know, always in the top three, three, three reasons for homelessness is families no longer willing or able to actually keep. 20% of the young people that come to us have come through the care system. Others have come through the criminal justice system. And the others then, families are no longer willing or able. And sometimes, you know, that's adolescent tensions go like that. You know, I call it wits end parenting, where, you know, you just, and you know yourself, I'll tell you the number of times like right down the road, you know that it's there. But actually, if you've got resources and if you've got support, and, and, and I heard it once described, and it was by the production manager at, at then Cadbury's, and he was talking to a business audience about homelessness, and he was describing it and how he understood it, and it's always stuck with me. He said it's like the four legs of a table, he sees it. If you've got your health, if you've got your job, if you've got your home, and if you've got good relationships, it's kind of pretty steady, your table. If one of those goes, and it could be any of them, you'll probably manage, if two of those go, you're on a real wobble, and if three goes, it's probably all over. 
And it won't happen to most of us because most of us have got depth to some of those. Most of us, even if you struggle with your home, you know, somebody else will help you out in the family. If you become unemployed, you'll manage. You'll manage. If your health is it, you'll have others around. But when that gets really intense and you haven't got that back up, then it's very, very easy to fall out of that. And if you add to that, in terms of the youth, the least experienced folks, okay, and yet we expect them to be able to navigate all of that and manage. And they don't. And our response, so when they come to St. Basil's, and over 5,000 come each year, it isn't about a shelter. It is about a home, mm -hmm. but it isn't about just a roof over their head. Mm -hmm. It is about believing in them. All those things we talked about what, that young people achieve going through the higher education system, it is about that. It is about knowing you've got to develop life skills. It is about trying things out. It is about making mistakes, screwing up, falling out with people, learning. It is about having aspiration and ambition and a belief that you will be able to do better. And it is ultimately about that ability to move on. And if you have a home and a job that's where you guys come in a lot, in constructive relationships. And actually, we deal with health, particularly mental health. It's a massive issue in terms of young people and the environment they're navigating now. Particularly, you add social media and everything else into that really toxic mix it can be if your vision of, of, of what is a good life is like some of the Snapchat, whatever, Instagram pictures that everybody else posts, and you're not doing that, and your life's pretty grim. So that's, that's what we try to do, with the help, obviously, of loads and loads of, of folks, many of whom will, will be here today. That's what we're trying to do. But fundamentally, we need a housing offer for youth. In fact, we need a housing offer, a housing strategy. Mm. We're all busy with homelessness strategies. Mm. We need a housing strategy. We need a national housing strategy that actually provides homes for people, not just a deficit situation. Mm where what we're doing is constantly finding more innovative ways of, of stopping people becoming homeless. We need to plan for what we want to achieve, not just what we want to avoid. Sorry, I had a rant. That's it, feel better now. No, thank you, Jean, that was really useful. And I think in terms of those kind of key reasons that you've played out for why you know, a young person may kind of experience homelessness, I think is really useful to kind of know. And also I think it, it kind of goes beyond even young people. I think some of those reasons are also for, yeah. for adults as, as well. Yeah. Okay, Lorna, so thank you for waiting patiently. Um, can you give us an insight into the role of the private sector and share with us what Gowling have been up to in, in, home, in around tackling homelessness? Yeah, sure, I think the first thing to do, and I think business has got a huge role to play here. First step, think broader than just rough sleepers. Okay, think about like Jim and, and Cole have, have, have um, de describe the, 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 Cal, the, the different types of Mike's feeding back um, people facing different stages of their journey of homelessness. Businesses can help at every stage. Okay, so businesses have a role looking in their own workforces and deciding how they can help um, prevent people becoming homeless. Okay, you think about some of those key triggers: family breakdown, mental health issues, long-term um, health problems. Um, you know, those are risk factors that could happen to any of our employees, okay? So think about creating a culture where people can, if they are experiencing that sort of thing, they can come and talk to you and ask for help and see what you as an employer can do to maybe just help bridge them through that difficult time. So there's a lot businesses can do around prevention. Um, the second thing is how best can businesses help those people who are sadly in crisis? So yes, now we are talking about people who may be rough sleeping. Um, help people, and certainly we hear, I hear it all the time, employees will come along, colleagues will say, I've walked from New Street to the business district in Birmingham, I've passed a dozen people, rough sleeping, what do I do, how can I help, do I feed them, do I give them money, what, what do I do? Help them, but help them in a safe way, and the best way to do that is to partner with the charities who are the experts, the St. Basil's, the Cycle Firesides of this world, they are best placed to help those rough sleepers off the streets, and it's complex, but actually giving a sandwich, giving a cup of coffee, giving money, actually may, in the best way in the world, may be perpetuating the problem. Okay, so work in partnership with charities um, and think about alternative ways of giving. There's a, um, a scheme called Change Into Action, which is a really smart way. You can give money 
uh, but rather than going direct to that individual rough sleeper, it will be used by a rough sleeper, but again, channeled through a partnership with a, a, a charity, so direct support is given in a, in a safe way. And then the last thing, I guess it's, this comes into sort of some of the work that Gowlands have done, um, is around employability. If you think about that homeless cycle, the best way, if you've got off the streets, or if you've never been on the streets, but you know, you're vulnerable, um, the best way to get into sustainable accommodation and to keep that going is to have a job, to have an income. But it's really hard to have a job if actually you've been through some of these really rough times, your confidence is rocked, you may not have anything on your CV recently. So employers can really help around the employability sphere, okay? Help with CV writing, workshops, mock interviews, crucially work experience uh, and actually giving jobs. And there's, I think here we're actually in the land of opportunity. You know, with the Commonwealth Games coming up, there are new roles being created and we're encouraging, we're talking to employers to say, actually, if you're going to bring it in, X number of new jobs. Think about what proportion of those could be given with a wraparound support to, uh, to colleagues. And certainly at Gowling, for, for, for many years, we've given work placements uh, to homeless um, people. And we've actually, you know, we're a law firm. We don't have many entry-level roles, but still we've managed to find um, roles. And we've got people on our payroll today who have been homeless. And if they don't go on to get a job with us, still their confidence has been boosted and they are you know, 10 times more employable than they were before they did the work experience. So there's loads that businesses can do. If you were going to give one piece of advice um, to the private sector, how best to get engaged with, with this challenge? What, okay. what would the best way be? Yeah, um, I would say educate yourself, a, a bit like I've been describing, just un understand the issues. And we recognise that it's really complex and difficult. So I, I represent the business sector on the Combined Authority Homelessness Task Force. And one of the things that we've been working on as a task force is creating a toolkit to help employers. Um, and that it's almost like you know, the, uh, part of it is a checklist, but there's loads of case studies and, and insights into what practical things businesses can do. Now, we're launching the first part of that toolkit on the 10th of October, um, which is World Homeless Day. Um, so that will be sort of the, the checklist element of it, that, and then the, the, the full launch will be um, towards the end of the year in, in December. So if you want to engage in that, get in touch with any one of us, and we can signpost you to that launch event um, and or get you make sure that you get a copy of that toolkit. But I think that toolkit has been designed based on all the work that we're doing and you know, giving employers the best chance to help. I'm sorry for that. Mm -hmm. Very plain mm -hmm. around. Thank you, Lorna, thanks. and thanks for bearing with, with the mic. Okay, so I could probably spend the rest of the afternoon asking this fab for lots of more questions, but I'm sure that you've got questions too. So I'm going to open, hope, open it up to the floor if you have any questions for us. Um, certain cities around the UK so far have delivered uh, temporary accommodation or move on alone, some successful, uh, some unsuccessful. What's the panel's take on that alternative? We all know how we have to is social, affordable homes. So, so, so I missed the first part. Um, temporary accommodation yeah, on what land? Te temporary accommodation on Blue Ball land. Mind. Right. Um, we're talking different methods, yeah. containers, modular, mm. uh, all sorts of, all sorts of yeah. technology to, to, mm -hmm. to solve the problem. Yeah. yeah, so I think local authorities have looked at this differently. So we're currently, we've been approached by a charity who wants to do some modular build. And they want that specifically for rough sleepers. So it would be somewhere safe for a rough sleeper to go for a night. I think they can work. It obviously depends where it is. It depends the pub. I don't like shipping containers. Um, but you can get some really nice modular properties now, which they call shipping containers. But actually, when you look at them for a rough sleeper who you've managed to engage on the street, what's difficult for our team sometimes is when they're engaging with a rough sleeper, but they haven't got an offer for them. They haven't got somewhere. And, and often with a rough sleeper, if they're saying, I'm willing to engage now, you've got to get them yeah. and you've got to yeah. get them into somewhere. So something like modular can play a real role in that. It's got to be in the right place. It's got to be the right type. And, and for me, it's got to be short term. A um, number of authorities mm. have got other modular type temporary accommodation units um, that they're using um, for long term for families. And again, it depends on, on, on what that accommodation is like and how well it's built. Obviously, you know, a lot of the modular type homes. Now we've got a couple recently being put in by Citizen um, in Coventry, which are great three bedroom houses, which are, are fantastic. And I say very different to the pods for, for rough sleepers. But 
I would say that there's a role there for them. Um, but for me, those, those pod type accommodations are very much short term yeah. while you're trying to engage with yeah. someone. And I think importantly as well, it, it, they can be a part of the response to yeah. how we tackle homelessness, but they can't be instead of building truly affordable housing, would be my view. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Go. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, as, as Neela mentioned at the beginning, I, I chair the Homelessness Task Force for the Combined Authority, and it was originally the Mayor's Task Force. And, and so, but from June now, we are adopted and embedded within the Combined Authority. And that means that the, the priority areas that we've identified as a task force, and all, all these guys are involved with the task force. Um, will also become part of the mainstream of the combined authority. So Gareth Bradford, in terms of the regeneration in housing, they're looking at a definition for affordable housing that is actually affordable for people, not you know just the name of a particular brand of housing. We're looking at all sorts of other issues. The jobs and skills is absolutely critical. And, and we are working with Julie yeah. Nugent and her team around the whole jobs and skills. And, and I mean, certainly an issue that Lorna, once, once we launch the, the, this toolkit and, and, you know, initially on the 10th there'll be this, this checklist, then we need to make sure, because there are employers like yourselves who are going to have loads of job opportunities and you are really willing to say, so how do we get the people that need it, that have experienced homelessness into those jobs? So we know we're already talking with the combined authority team to say, we need to make it easier for those employers. You know, we need to make it, they don't have to go to dozens of organisations that work with homeless people. So we've got to, we've got to have some kind of, of, of gateway into those jobs. We've also got to help prepare the people, make the bridge, and then support both the employer and the individual. Because with the best will in the world, they'll present really yeah. well early doors, and some it will be fine, but others, by week two, they'll be, they'll be self-excluding. And they'll be expecting rejection because that's what's always happened. So they'll, they'll exclude first, they'll self-exclude first. So we, with you, have to work together to really understand why that person might behave in that way, how you can avoid that, and how collectively we can wrap around them until actually it's the norm for them. And, and you know, so you're, you're absolutely right. Please make that point every time you talk to the combined authority teams as well because, you know, they are keen to do it. Please. Yeah, we can. It seems to line in the audience, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes, totally. If we can prevent the thought, yeah. Yeah. It is. And and the other thing we need to do is we need to understand that that the jobs is fantastic. But if somebody hasn't got somewhere actually affordable to live from their earned income, mm. then we've got a problem. Yeah. So for example, young people. Young people that are homeless cannot afford to take up apprenticeships because the cost of living, unless you're living in a parental home where they're not charging you any rent and probably by paying for your transport and everything else, you can't do it. So, so the other issue that we're looking at is, is really kind of affordable models for young people where the rent is deflated below benefit level so they can actually experience living from their earned income. So we've got example, we've got example of that in, in Sandwell. So you know your, your pod issue, whatever it is, it, it's just about us using our collective wit and will in order to make sure that that's possible and that we treat those, it, it's community parenting, I call it, that we treat those young people the same as we would want for our own. Sorry. Good. Yeah. 
Yes. Yes. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah, so we, so we do, um, we are piloting um, a housing first programme in the West Midlands across the seven combined um, constituent authorities. Um, and I'm going to actually ask Cal and Jim to tell us a little bit more about how that's play, playing out. Okay, yep. so um, yes, we're very fortunate uh, in the West Mids to have a housing first pilot. Um, the other pilots are in the Liverpool region and the Manchester region. Um, our pilot in um, the West Mids is, is slightly different to the, the other areas in that um, the um, modelling is devolved down to different local authority areas and that's a really good thing because it means we can shape our offer according to the uniqueness of the area and the profile of uh, rough sleeping in, in that uh, locality. It also means that in terms of support services they're, they're closer to the ground as well so we're really pleased about that. Um, I think the other thing that's um, a key focus of, of our um, programme is a good focus on prevention because what we don't want is a program that waits for people to be mm. in extreme crisis before we make them a housing first offer mm. so we know there's national research everywhere which clearly tells you who the key cohorts of population are that are likely to land on the streets are on a, and on are on a very strong trajectory towards the streets. So pilot, part of our piloting is to capture those individuals. Um, I'm going to give you a case study just to put some life to this. Um, in Birmingham, we had a young woman um, who had a history of rough sleeping. Um, she had uh, children taken into care as a consequence of that um, and was, was about to go through the same thing again. What we were able to do in Birmingham is to prevent that in terms of the next child. We made a housing first offer, um, wrapped a whole range of support agencies around her, around substance misuse, around mental health, around day-to-day -day living, around um, financial inclusion. And what we've managed to do is keep a family household together. That is upstream prevention. If you think about it, the cost to the care system as a consequence of three children being in care, yeah. and what we've done is brought a family together under Housing First. Now, you wouldn't necessarily see that because you'll associate that with single white males on the street. Um, but as I say, we are making a much broader offer. Is it working? We would always say it's part of the solution, we'd yeah. say, Jim. Yeah. yeah. Um, is it working? Yes, it is. It's early days. We're in, just moving into year two at the moment, and <coughs> I'll, I'll give you examples from Birmingham. Um, we've got 25 people in Housing First tenancies, um, with the exception of one. Uh, everybody that's gone in is still there. So that just shows you, in terms of people with extreme vul vulnerabilities, that it that it can work. Um, we've got. We are heavily reliant on a couple of things though. One is for housing providers to make us housing first tenancy mm -hmm. offers. The other links to your point around um, employment training and education as well. Mm -hmm. So when people are ready down the line, we need to make sure in terms of their ability to retain and sustain those tenancies, there's a plan in terms of their, their, you know, their mm. future uh, well-being aspirations and their yeah. life aspirations as well. Jim, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I just I think it's a fantastic opportunity. We're mm. just starting in Coventry. We've got our support provider now procured. They're now engaging with people sleeping rough in the in the city. We've got a cohort of 20 individuals now who are identified. A number of those have been on the streets for years, entrenched rough sleepers. Um, not always the people that landlords want to accommodate, if mm. we're honest. Mm. Yeah. So there's a real challenge there, but our housing associations have stepped up and we're getting properties and looking for properties now in order to house these people because with Housing First, and the great opportunity for us is the funding that's come in provides a real wraparound support for individuals and they can have as much support as they need in order to make that tenancy work. And through the Housing First label, we can pull in all the mental health workers, substance misuse, um, other health care, care support, 
and pull in a lot of different agencies to work with individuals because we are targeting some of the most entrenched rough sleepers um, in Coventry. And with that, yeah, comes a lot of support needed. But it's, yeah, it's a fantastic opportunity for us to, to actually get people off the streets and into permanent accommodation and keep them there. Because mm. getting them off is sometimes easier than actually mm. getting somebody in and keeping yeah. them in that accommodation longer term. Because if you've slept rough for 10 years, you know, we hear stories a lot. Rough sleepers get given a flat and actually sleep outside the flat sometimes for the first couple of weeks. And then they'll move into the flat, won't sleep on the bed that's being provided. You know, they've slept out for a long time. So once you've got yeah. them somewhere, keeping them in is absolutely crucial. Okay, so I think we're out of time now. Um, so we hope from today's session that you've kind of got an idea of some of the work that's going on across the region, some of the reasons behind the increases in homelessness. But more, most importantly, I think the take home today is that we as the homelessness sector can't do this on our own and we need our partners in other sectors to work with us to kind of get us there so that we're preventing and tackling homelessness in a better way and for that people in our region are getting better outcomes. So could you just please join me in thanking the panel. Thank you. Thank you.